Hey folks, David Lennick here. The show is taking a break for the holidays, so we've selected a couple of our most popular episodes from 2022 to run for the next few weeks. Don't worry, though. We'll be back with new content in the new year. In the meantime, have a happy holiday and enjoy these classic episodes of Celebrity Estates, Wills of the Rich and Famous. Welcome to the Celebrity Estates Wills of the Rich and Famous podcast. In this podcast, we break down high-profile celebrity estate planning cases for advisors and their clients. Most celebrity estate catastrophes are based on the same issues that everyday people face, just with the volume turned up. Our goal is to identify and extract the individual estate planning issues that lie at the heart of each story. We then discuss what advisors should expect and how to avoid common pitfalls. Hosted by WealthManagement.com Senior Editor David Lenock. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of WealthManagement.com's Celebrity Estates, Wills of the Rich and Famous. For anyone new to the podcast, in each installment, myself and a guest take on a different celebrity estate and attempt to extract some key lessons that planners can apply to their more traditional clients. The idea being that celebrity estate planning stories, although often ridiculous in their details, generally have at their cores very basic issues that can just as easily apply to non-famous or fabulously wealthy clients. We're joined again this week by Dan Griffith. Dan is Senior Vice President and Director of Wealth Strategy at Huntington Private Bank. He's an experienced attorney with a passion for helping families and business owners find solutions to their planning challenges. Dan develops insights for clients and writes and speaks about asset protection, estate tax issues, and business succession planning. Thanks so much for joining us, Dan. David, I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me. So our subject, this one is actually a pretty topical one. It's uh, Pat Boland, who's the past owner of the Denver Broncos. Uh, Pat was a Canadian-American lawyer and executive. He was the majority owner of the NFL Denver Broncos. The Boland family, including his two brothers, John and Bill, and his sister, Mary Beth, purchased the team from Edgar Kaiser in 1984 for uh, $78 million. Boland served as the Broncos CEO from the purchase of the club in 84 until July of 2014, when he stepped down to the onset and progression of Alzheimer's disease. He sadly passed of a pulmonary embolism in June of 2019 and was inducted to the Pro Football Hall of Fame that same year. However, we're less interested in Boland's life here than we are in his succession plan. And in a refreshing twist, there actually was a sophisticated one in place. Boland put a family trust in place in 2009 to run the team in the event of his incapacity. The trust is run by three trustees, Team CEO Joe Ellis, Team General General Counsel Rich Silvko, and local attorney Mary Kelly, all for the benefit of Boland's seven children from two different marriages. The trust took over in 2014 when Boland stepped aside with the express purpose of choosing the next owner from among Boland's children or selling the team. Now, it's important to note here that the NFL rules require that a single individual own at least 60% of a team which makes multi-generational ownership a particular challenge. You know, the famously publicly owned Packers are a notably grandfathered in exception. It's the last major sports league with such a requirement. The others have fully embraced ownership conglomerates composed of many investors as franchise values have exploded and the pool of single individuals capable of shelling out so much cash up front has dwindled. At least two of Boland's children expressed interest in running the club. Beth Bolin Wallace, the second oldest from his first marriage, worked at the team for several years until her position was eliminated in 2015. Bolin Wallace told the New York Times in 2018 that she believed she was qualified and ready to take control. The trust, though, suggested that it supported Brittany Bolin, who's 31, one of the five children from Bolin's second marriage, who is currently an executive of the team. The trustees have said that if all seven of the Bolin children don't back any single chosen successor, then they would look to sell the team. Needless to say, the children remain divided. In 2018, Boland's two children from his first marriage, Boland Wallace and Amy Boland Clemmer, sued the administrators of the trust, claiming that their father was suffering the effects of Alzheimer's disease when he set it up, and that the trustees unduly influenced him. In July of this year, the judge overseeing the case dismissed it, ruling that the trust agreement reflected Boland's intent and will, and that Ellis and the other trustees had full and complete authority to administer the trust. Now, this decision clears the way for the team to be sold, which at the time of the recording is believed to be imminent, but has yet to officially occur. It's anticipated that the team will fetch an excess of $4 billion, making it the most expensive sale of a North American sports franchise ever, and underlining nicely just how few individuals there are around capable of shouldering that 60% upfront burden. 
Now, Dan, one of the interesting things about the NFL's model is that though it is somewhat hostile to multi-generational ownership, it still positions the teams overwhelmingly as family-owned businesses. What are some lessons that more typical family business owners can take from the successes and failures of Pat Boland's planning? Well, again, Dave, thanks for having me and uh, glad to be here and uh, glad to be talking about what I think is a, a fascinating topic. It's a little different than some of the cautionary tales that uh, that normally you delve into. And as we mentioned before, even with some really good planning, there are some, some elements of this that reflect the fact that uh, none of us have a perfect plan and it's something we all have to work on a little bit. And that's a good example of what we're looking at here when it comes to the team itself, which is asking the question, does the business itself have its own estate plan? And it's something that we ask for a lot of family-owned businesses. A lot of business owners think of themselves and the business as one intertwined, un unseparatable kind of entity. Uh, and practically, it's that way. But in many ways, the business owner is different than the business itself. And the business needs to have some plan for where to go uh, and what to do after the business owner, who sometimes can be the secret sauce, uh, is gone. And so that's what we're looking at here is when uh, even as early as the 2000s, when Pat uh, realized that he was having some challenges and issues and knew, knew that he needed to step away uh, and went through several machinations of preparing for that and planning for that, even still, we're looking at a situation where there's a lot up in the air. And in fact, even the sale itself was delayed in order to get the business kind of moved to what who knows will be uh, who knows will be the new owner for a pretty expensive franchise. I I don't know, David, if you put your your bid in yet, but uh, I have not I have not put mine in. We'll see how that goes. Oh yeah, I plan on throwing the full weight of the celebrity estate's fortune behind my bid to buy the Broncos. A big lot of lot of podcast money there. Sure, <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> so then you, know, you mentioned that every business needs its own estate plan. How is that? different from, say, you know, making a state plan for business versus making a state plan for a person? So what are the, the ingredients? Well, that's one of the things I think that's important when you're dealing with business owners is to look around and say, uh, what are some of the hypotheticals that we need to run through? And so the documents are different, right? When we think of a traditional estate plan for an individual, we think of wills and trusts and healthcare proxies. But what we, we don't realize is that many people need to look at different documents for the estate plan for a business. No surprise, those are documents that some businesses have, like buy-sell agreements, um, but even things as simple as updated operating agreements, management agreements, key employee retention plans, those are all really important. And for even the smallest businesses, it's important to look and say, hey, has somebody updated the beneficiary designations? Or have you made sure that the, uh, the, the entity's shares or units are put in a trust properly in order to make that work? Those are all things to consider when you're thinking about the entity itself. So, you know, notably, we're talking about estate planning. And generally, I think when most people hear the words estate planning, they think death, right, rightfully so. Mm -hmm. um, however, in, in Pat Boland's particular case, and in, many, in the case of many businesses, it's actually sort of less important to plan for death and more important to plan for incapacity. So how do those two planning styles differ? What, how, you know, in terms of planning for death, planning for incapacity, what are the priorities? How do they change? So I think they are two separate entities. It's a little bit like when uh, you're dealing with a prenuptial agreement, people think of, well, if we get divorced, what do we need to do? But prenuptial agreements that are effective also deal with death. And the same thing would be true here when you're dealing with the business owner. It's important to say it's important to go through a scenario where the business owner would be incapacitated and equally as important to say, what if somebody passes away with their boots on uh, in the business uh, themselves? We see many, many business owners who who die at their desk, unfortunately, but many of them really kind of decline and get in a position where the business can suffer because they're either suffering from a disability that they're unwilling to accept. And as a result, um, you have a situation where there's kind of a coup within the family or creditors get involved and there's kind of catastrophe. Uh, or in Pat Boland's case, people kind of step up and say, hey, I want to make sure I'm doing the right thing, both for the business, frankly, for the community of, of Denver and for the family by saying, I'm going to start to transition to make sure that there isn't a catastrophe, which I think he did fairly successfully relative to what we see for a lot of business owners. Yeah. And I think that's important to stress here, right? That just because there was sort of lawsuits and such going on here does not mean that the succession plan is necessarily a failure. Part of the success of the succession plan was saying, okay, we can sell the team. It, it allowed for that eventuality, which is the eventuality that's come to pass. That's right. 
That's right. I think to answer your question more fully then as well, David, it's to look back when it comes to disability and say, who are the people that get to make the determination that disability exists? I, and also really taking time to say, in the event that I'm unable to make decisions as a business owner, who are the trusted advisors I can have around me who can either say, hey, Dan, I, I noticed that you're missing a step here. Or when I raise my own hand and say, I'm doing that, that, I'm feeling something different than I normally do, like Pat did in his case, that they can step up and say, hey, we're here to help. Uh, again, less a light switch in many cases than it is uh, a spectrum and a transition. And so getting good advisors and, and being deliberate about who gets to choose. Here you had you know, one current wife, one ex-wife, seven kids, and trusted advisors. Who gets to say what the definition of incapacitated is? I think Pat did a good job of here, here of uh, making that definition in anticipation. And even when other folks uh, raised their hand to the court and said, we think this is different, the court tended to support what Pat put in place. And I think that's a good sign and something that we can, a lot of us can emulate. Yeah. And one thing this case really hammers home also is, is the need to do this incapacity planning as early as humanly possible. You know, even in, in a case where you have the foresight to notice that you're feeling different and, and not quite up to your old self and you start planning, that's one thing. And that's kind of how it happened here. And even that led to some lawsuits, right? Where, because we've already shown the signs of incapacity. So it makes, you know, the argument available that, well, you know, he was maybe worse off than he even thought he was. And he didn't have the capacity to even put this plan in place in the first place. But also it makes it easier to talk to clients, I think, the earlier you tackle this, because these are very powerful people generally used to having their way, used to being, you know, the face and control of a business. And if they start noticing signs of incapacity, some can have the self-awareness of a Pat Bolin to say, oh, this is a problem for me in my business. I need to start planning to make this fixed. Others can get very insecure about it, and then it can make the conversation even harder to start having as they get more and more defensive about their declining capabilities. David, I think that's right. And if you look at it a little bit more deeply, it really affects the value of the business itself. And again, it goes yeah. back to our theme originally, which is that the, the entity itself has its own life and, and should have its own succession plan because the owner is really only one part of that. And so you begin to say, if we are not clear about what's going to happen, if somebody becomes incapacitated, even if it's temporarily so, you know, we look back at the beginning of the, the COVID crisis, you know, if somebody was in the hospital for a couple of weeks and they're the chairman and CEO, then they've got big decisions to make. I would hate to think, you know, what happens when someone like Pat Bolin is temporarily incapacitated right at the draft time or a time when you're choosing a new coach. And so I think it, it goes to the economic vitality of the business itself to say, even if somebody trips and falls briefly, what are we going to do uh, to make sure that the business itself retains its vitality? <laughs> And it's great that you brought up this uh, idea of value here, because particularly with us North American sports franchises, but with any family business, you know, the value for some businesses, if you're doing well, can dramatically increase from you know the founding to when this plan actually goes in place. We saw in this case that I believe it was seventy-eight million dollars in 1984, which in 1984 money was what? It's two hundred million dollars ish. Um, that was that was a lot of money back then. Still a lot of money, but it's no, it's a far cry from four billion dollars that this thing is about to sell for, even when you adjust for for time. So. You know, what do you do and how do you, what happens when, when the value of a business explodes like this? And maybe not to billions, but, you know, by a factor of what it was initially worth. Well, I think there are some some things to consider there, too, that we're seeing some important trends. The first one is uh, if you've got generation three or generation four, um, I, I had this conversation just a couple of weeks ago where generation three was a son who was looking to take over the business from the father. And father, of course, had gotten it almost as a gift from his father. Uh, and in that situation, uh, the generation three was saying, listen, you got this for free, essentially, from your parents. Why am I not getting this for free? Why do I have to come up with complex purchase agreements? And the answer that I kind of gently reminded generation three of was when dad took it over from grandpa, it was worth you know $100,000. And now this is a $25 million business. Uh, and so, and, and similarly, that conversation was, you took this business over when you were, you know, 30 years old, I've got to wait until I'm 45 and I've kind of proven myself. And it's not, not kind of a like kind exchange, right? It's, it's a different scenario. And so that, that's part of what 
we work with from an emotional standpoint when you're dealing with business family succession planning is, you know, what does it look like today versus what was what were, was the deal that was in place before? I think the other piece that's important is just the value of businesses themselves have gone up so high that later generations are struggling to come up with the capital to make a purchase mm-hmm. and or uh, families are having trouble coming up with ways to gift it or move it to the next generation uh, without triggering significant gift and estate tax consequences. So we're talking about that a lot too. Uh, An example, David, you mentioned uh, in in this particular example, I think I saw a Forbes estimate that something like only 150 people in in the United States have a net worth high enough to qualify to be one of the 60, you know, a 60% owner uh, to purchase the Denver Broncos. And I mean, that doesn't even include someone like Peyton Manning, who's made a, who's made a bid. So if we're in a position where someone like Peyton Manning isn't affluent enough to qualify, that may be a challenge that the NFL looks at overall. And and a lot of family businesses are looking at too. Yeah. And all the time, you know, these businesses are, you know, even though they're exceptionally profitable, it's not liquid profit, right? You're, you're really having to, you're not recognizing the the money from these businesses until the the liquidity event. That's right. That's right. And again, that appreciation over time is, is exceptional. I looked, look back to see, you know, the Rooney's purchased the Steelers back in 1933 for like $2,500. Uh, and so for somebody today to say, hey, you know, you got this as a gift from an earlier generation. Why can't I get it as a gift? It's, you know, it's a, it's a crazy question in some ways. The appreciation makes it impossible. So, you know, a lot of, you know, choosing these transitions and managing all these complicated factors um, it requires good advisors, but you know, I think we assume a lot of times that, oh, people who've made a lot of money, um, who become sort of high net worth, ultra wealthy, whatever you want to put it, have always had good advisors, right? They're, they're clearly, I mean, how could they not? But I think often that that's not necessarily the case. And, and where can like, you know, good advisors, where can you spot that advisors aren't in place? Where can a good advisor really come in here? Yeah, I would agree with that. I, I think it's it's one of the things that's been an eye-opening experience for me in the, the 20 years that I've had a chance to do this. And that is my assumption, as you just articulated, was that folks who were fairly bright, and I think everyone would would uh, agree that Pat Bowen was an extremely bright individual, very capable, kind of went to law school just for fun, which to me sounds to me sounds a little crazy. Um, but you know, even in that position, I, we would assume, hey, they're going to choose really good tax advisors, really good legal advisors, and take their advice. And, and from all external views, it appears as if he did. And yet, um, it's still not a bulletproof plan. And there's still some hypotheticals that weren't dealt with. And I would say during uh, during my career, what I've seen is that even very smart, very thoughtful, capable people, um, just because they're high net worth individuals have not necessarily chosen good advisors. They're busy just like the rest of us. They you know, are in a position where they kind of put things off just like the rest of us do. Uh, it's just the consequences of those things are a lot higher. Uh, and so having a good advisor and have a good group of people makes a big difference. Um, it's sometimes hard for people who are really affluent to choose people who they really trust. A lot of advisors can tend to be like vendors for them as opposed to trusted advisors. Uh, And they need guidance, not just in developing the plan, but also ultimately in executing the plan itself. That's what they need help with, which is no different than any of the rest of us. So getting good advisors is really important. This is a really good point, Dan. I think also, you know, the flip side of that, you know, trouble finding people they can trust is I think a lot of times when you're dealing with generational wealth, you can find them falling into that similar trap that people fall into when they're sort of naming trustees or the naming uh, executors. Where you know, oh, well, this is you know my lawyer from when I founded the business. I trust him, but that guy was probably a small town lawyer when you founded your small business, and this is now a four billion dollar business. Likely, he's not particularly capable of of being you know the general counsel for this business anymore. But you trust him, so you know there's a lot of that push and pull of you know good advisor has a lot of meanings, right? Where it's like trusted is one part, but actually having the capability to service the business at all is is a whole other question. That's right. And it goes a little bit back to our theme when we, we mentioned the issue of dealing with incapacity. 
Uh, a lot of people now, one of the trends that we see, particularly for family businesses, of folding in experts outside of the family who not who are not just advisors, but frankly have fiduciary decision making roles. You know, they're like we have in the Boland situation, able to look at family members and say, "We don't think you're ready," or "This doesn't make sense from a business perspective to have you in control." Uh, which ultimately indirectly benefits the family by retaining the value of the business and not letting people who who may not be ready to take over a four billion dollar business uh, take the reins, you know. Uh, and so that's a big piece too: is that people are not only saying, "Give me good advice." But I want you to be there to step in and say, I want to give this, you know, transition that advice to the next generation or make decisions that are unemotional and unconnected with family that indirectly will still benefit the family. So that's one of the the things that we see happening today a little more often. Yeah. And it's also important to point out that most benefit of the family, best interest of the family doesn't necessarily mean giving the business to selling the business to a family member. Or, you know, I think uh, one of the interesting sort of uh, conspiratorial parts of this Denver Broncos story is um, the addition of that, you know, that the, the trustees have taken on that sort of, well, if all seven don't agree, then we're going to sell it. Cause, cause that's not in the documents. That's not part of Pat Bullen's trust. That's something that they came up with themselves. And while on its surface, it seems like, yeah, we want to keep family unity. A more cynical person could look at that and say, they know these kids aren't going to agree that one of them should get it. So, because they don't think any of them really should get it, but they don't want to say that. And this is a way to sort of ensure the sale without looking like the bad guy who's who's taking the team away from the Bolin family. Even though, you know, in, they're still serving their roles as fiduciaries and trustees by serving the best interest of the family because, you know, they think that the children will do better with the money they get from the sale versus the money they make from keeping the team. And that's exactly right. One of the neat things about this particular scenario, David, is Pat Boland put these these trustees in place just as he was beginning to kind of understand and see his incapacity. And so he had a chance to try these folks out and see what their decision making looked like, even in a situation where he probably could have kind of vetoed some of the decision making that they made, that they ended up making. And so um, that's one of the things that I think is also really pretty wise about this. He chose good advisors, put good parameters in place, uh, and then had a chance to try them out, have them uh, kind of audition, if you will, a little bit to see how things went. And frankly, during that time, uh, the, the team did pretty well. And so I think they had a track record that he could defend for himself and justify for himself. That's something other folks might want to think about and emulate from this plan. Yes. Yeah, so up to this point in the conversation, we've really been focusing on the main owner, main business owner being forced out somehow effectively, right? Either be it through their increasing in capacity, making it so they can't do their job anymore, or you know, death, the ultimate force out. <laughs> um, but that's not the only way these things can happen. How, how about retiring? Why does that? That comes up so less, so much less often when we're talking about family business owners than you know, sort of a more traditional sort of salary worker. Why is it so difficult for family business owners to just retire? Well, one of the things that I love about working with business owners is, of course, the passion that they have for what they do. I'm lucky enough to be married to a business owner, and she loves what she does. She really does it very well. But the other thing that we see with uh, business owners is that they're also constantly, in some way or another, talking about what's next from a retirement standpoint, but they don't talk about it like some traditional employees might, right? I'm going to get my gold watch and have a party and then kind of kind of move on because it is their passion you know, a lot of them don't want to turn it off entirely. And so what we see is many, many more business owners, uh, you know, end up dying with their boots on because they can't really give up. And so it's not like, you know, dealing with uh, maybe an affluent physician or uh, an executive when you talk about retirement planning and you start to say, do you have enough money? And at what point do you do you put your sword down and walk away? It's really saying, what do you want to consider from a quality of life standpoint? You know, what about, you know, what about being involved in this business? Really is it that you're passionate about? You know, if it's, if it's, uh, you know, the R&D that, that, created the product that made your business, then why not get back into the shop and do a little bit of that too? And the other benefit of that is that you get to go back to the business owner and say, 
is this a time then which will allow you to have a win-win scenario? It will allow you to do what it is about the business that you love doing. And at the same time, we can maybe begin to put in place some of those advisors to make some unemotional and best for the business decisions that will allow you to transition in one way or another. And so it's really talking to a lot of business owners about what can you do to take things off of your plate? And really, again, cautionary tales to share about people passing away with their boots on. You know, Pat Boland didn't really have a chance to enjoy retirement. But, you know, he was the owner of a pretty successful, pretty successful Denver Broncos franchise. I bet he had a lot of fun while he was doing it, while he was live. He was a very involved owner and and very involved in the NFL broadly. And so, you know, for him, I don't know that he ever would have stepped away and say, hey, you know, I'm going to give away my day job. I don't see why he'd want to do that. So maybe getting these outside advisors in place would allow him to kind of do more of what he enjoyed uh, as opposed to kind of a more traditional retirement format. Yeah, and I, th- I think this this quality of life idea is really a great place to sort of wrap things up because if I'm being honest, it's it's probably a big enough topic for for its own podcast at this point. Mm-hmm. Um, but it is, in my opinion, again, I'm editorializing here, but quality of life is should be a larger part of the discussion in all financial advising, not just family businesses or ultra wealthy for everyone. And um, sometimes that's a failure of the advisors who you know have generally measured themselves based on AUM going up, up, up. And sometimes, you know, fiduciaries can have their hands tied a little bit by um, by their legal by the legal uh, requirements to sort of best interest of the client. The only measurable, again, being money, and it's hard to measure quality of life and sort of, you know. So there, there are sort of many factors pulling advisors away from this, but it is something that, nonetheless, I think needs to come into the equation more and more. I, I agree with that as well, David. I think if you look at what the definition of retirement is, it has evolved significantly. I mean, I look at the folks who, you know, generation before me were coming out of the plant, you know, having worked there 30 years uh, and, and worked physically very very hard. And so it was more of a light switch because it was something that, you know, your body just couldn't hold up to it. Uh, and life expectancy was shorter. Now, as I look at my own children and, you know, they're able to pursue their passions earlier uh, and like Pat Boland do things that really didn't count as work, but were, were more enjoying their day job as something that they enjoy doing overall. That means that I think they're going to be able to work a lot longer because the work is going to be less oppressive, if you will. I hope my boss isn't listening to hear say that, but I, I love <laughs> what I do. And so it's I, I can do it for a really long time, I hope. Uh, and I know a lot of other people are in that position as well. And so business owners, I think, reflect a growing trend, which is if you really enjoy what you're doing on a, on a day-to-day basis, you're willing and happy to do it uh, a lot longer. And for the workforce, especially with the shortage that we currently have of, of, of warm bodies to get things done, maybe that's a good thing. Well, that's all the time we have for today, folks. I'd like to thank Dan Griffith for once and again being a fantastic guest. Thanks so much, Dan. Oh, David, thank you for having me and uh, always glad to be here. And for all our listeners, I'll see you, or I guess you'll hear me on the next episode of Celebrity Estates, Wills of the Rich and Famous. Thank you for listening to the Celebrity Estates Wills of the Rich and Famous podcast. Click the subscribe button below to become notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of InformaWealthManagement.com. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning.